Father, thank you for being our salvation. It is a wonderful thing, Lord, to hear your church singing such great truths of the faith. But Lord, now we come to hear from you. And I pray that we would settle in and realize the reality of this moment. It happens every week, and it's tempting to become casual and routine about it, Lord, but I pray that, that we would sit here and listen as though you were with us now speaking to us, because that's what's happening. This is your word. This is not just a title we give it or a label, Lord. We believe this is your word to us, and I pray that we would receive it with the reverence that is due for it. And that we would respond to it in a way that shows that you are Lord and authority over all, that we would sit under your word, that I would sink into the background and the magnificence of your word would go forward. It would be changing that your spirit would be here and moving among us, causing us to be different, shaping us into the likeness of Christ. So, Spirit, come and work in this time. I pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, please turn in your copy of God's holy and perfect word to Titus chapter 3. A few weeks ago, I saw a poll asking pastors what their main challenges were during this time of COVID-19. Many of them you would expect. Things like not being able to meet together in a regular way. How do we set up a live stream? Ensuring that precautions are being followed. But do you know what the number one response was from pastors of what they're dealing with, challenges they're facing in this time of COVID-19? If you were to guess, what would you say? Number one response was differing, differing, it was just a drum roll for the answer there. <laughs> differing political opinions concerning the virus. And in the middle of this virus pandemic, another political hotbed has risen involving things like race and injustice, which has further heated the political environment in the church, in the world, and it has brought it into the church. And we haven't even gotten to the election yet. These political tensions are expressed in conversations, in emails, in the news, and radio, and social media, and memes, and text. You'd have to bury your head in the sand not to realize the tension that's around us. You have your own decisions you have to make your own opinions that you hold, your own convictions. You have to work with these people and go to church with these people and be in the same community with these people and stand in line with these people and be at the stoplight staring at a bumper sticker of these people. You are these people. All this got me thinking in this environment what are Christians known for? Specifically in America right now, what are Christians known for? If you're a Christian, what are you known for? If we ask the average non believer, the average co worker, the average neighbor, what his perception of a Christian is, how would he describe us? What would the world say that we care about most? Sadly, this is becoming a more complicated question to answer. It wasn't always complicated, though. If you think back to the first century Christians, you'll remember exactly why they got that name. 
In Acts 11, we see recorded where the people who followed the Christ were first labeled Christians. And that's exactly what they were known for. People who were known for following the Christ, Jesus, the Christ, the one they believed to be the Messiah, the one they believed to be a man who died on a cross and then rose from the grave three days later. How radical is that? It's a group of people who went around preaching that message. And they so lived in the reality of that message that they were labeled, those people are of the Christ, the one who claimed to die and was risen from the grave. My oh my, how muddied the waters have become over 20 centuries later. How easy it is to bear that name, Christian, in 2020 America. And nowadays, there's droves of people who would label themselves as Christian without having any idea who the Christ is and, frankly, what the term even means. Christian, over the last 200 years or so, especially in America, has slowly dissolved into a cultural category that one is born into instead of a conscientious choice that one commits himself to. And because of this disintegration of authentic biblical Christianity, factions and variations have broken out like uncontrolled weeds, which has led to countless misunderstandings about who Christians actually are and what they actually believe. For example, if you ask the question, what are Christians known for? What do they stand for? In the first century, people would have said, that's the group of people, that's the radicals, the group of people who have given their lives to follow the man Jesus. But now the waters are so muddied at this point in our society that it's led some to say, what what are Christians known for? What do they stand for? Well, which Christians are you talking about? Are you talking about the conservative Christians or the liberal Christians? The evangelical Christians or the Catholic Christians or the social justice Christians, the Black Lives Matter Christians, the Republican or Democratic Christians, the born again Christians, like some will say, are you a born again Christian? Friends, I didn't know there was any other kind. It's not possible to be a Christian without being born again. What do Christians stand for? Well, which group are you talking about? And friends, this is sad because for most of the groups I just mentioned, they're not known for biblical Christianity at all, but for their political and societal passions. Christians are known for their commitment to Christ. Christians are known for their commitment, unwavering, unadulterated, not watered down, commitment to Christ. And there's a danger in losing our identity when we attach any adjective to the front of our name. One author writes this stirring observation. This is a a longer quote, but it's so stirring, I, I need to read it in full. He says, quote, a politicized faith not only blurs our priorities, but weakens our loyalties. Our primary citizenship is not on earth, but in heaven. Though few evangelicals would deny this truth in theory, the language of our spiritual citizenship frequently gets wrapped in the red, white, and blue. Rather than acting as resident aliens of a heavenly kingdom, too often we sound and act like resident apologists for Christian America. Unless we reject the false reliance on the illusion of Christian America, evangelicalism will continue to distort the gospel and thwart a genuine biblical identity. 
American evangelicalism is now covered by layers and layers of historically shaped attitudes that obscure our original biblical core, end quote. And here's why all this matters. Christians will be known for something in our society. And if you wear the name of Christ, if you call yourself a Christian, you are part of setting the narrative for what we are known for. You are serving as a representative of, of God in front of a, a watching world and what you're declaring with your mouth and your actions and your passions declares what God is like, what he requires, what he cares most about. And the overwhelming emphasis in the Bible is that God's primary concern is, does man glorify him by being in right relationship to him? God, yes, cares about community flourishing. He cares about righteous political leaders. He cares about justice within society. God cares about setting rights wrong, but his main concern in the scripture is will you glorify him by being in right relationship to him? This is why he sent his son, because mankind was not in right relationship with God, but we were in rebellion against God, and still the majority stays. Sends his son to die in the place. This is the climax of human history when Jesus paid for sin by dying on the cross. He secured right relationship with God by rising from the dead. This is the salvation that he has provided for any who would turn from sin and trust in him for salvation. That's what Christians are known for. That message And political issues and social justices matter tremendously, but none of them overcome the importance of the need to be made right with your creator, God. So if you bear the name of Christ in the room and call your name a Christian or call yourself a Christian, I would ask you personally, what are you known for? How do you represent God with your words, your actions, your passions? Because watching eyes are everywhere. Every moment is an opportunity for you to portray what really matters in life. And as a Christian, we all have that responsibility, which is the very point of Titus 3 this morning. Last week, we saw in chapter 2, that the grace that redeems us continues to renovate us. This morning, we see Paul will continue in that same theme to Christians. In chapter two, he addressed the various age groups in the church. Remember the older and men and women, younger men and younger women. But now he has a word to all Christians as we interact in the world as God's representatives. As Christians live in the middle of a pagan society, every action and reaction is a witness or a testimony for your faith. It's giving your faith credibility or opportunity for ridicule. Paul is going to remind us that yes, while we are residents of this world, we are citizens of heaven. So here's his main point that we're going to see from this text. Saved people are changed people. And changed people are different people from the world. Saved people are changed people, and changed people are different people from the world. Look with me in Titus chapter 3. We'll cover the first five verses. Remind them to be submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy toward all people. For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. We're going to finish the rest of verse 5 next week. We'll stop there for now. But when the goodness 
and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Notice Paul's logic in the first five verses. In verse one and two, he reminds the Christians how they are to live in a pagan world. He says, be submissive to rules and authorities, be obedient, be ready for every good work, speak evil of no one, avoid quarreling, be gentle, show courteous, courtesy to all people. He says, remember to live like this, and then he explains in verse three why. He says, for, that's like saying because, And then he reminds them how they used to be. Live like this because we were at one time foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to passion and pleasures, having malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. He says, live like this, different from the world, because remember, we used to live like this, just like them. So what changed? Did you clean up? Did you have a new perspective? Did you mature? Verse four, but when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. In other words, we can live like this now and not how we used to live because God saved us from that life. You see that logic? Do you remember the life that God saved you from? Do you remember how you used to be? Paul says, don't go back to it. Live differently. Live like this, not how you, we used to live because God has saved us. He's changed us. Saved people are changed people and changed people are different people from the world. Friends, are you different from the world? Or do you blend in? There's a reason Jesus called us salt. What does it say about us if the world violently rejected the one we claim to follow and yet gladly accepts us? To be a Christian is to be different fundamentally. It's always been the case. Christians do not wear cultural camouflage. And as I've evaluated these political societal tensions recently, I thought, what can I say to our church that would be appropriate and wise during this time of tension? What will we be known for in such a hostile environment? Because everyone has an opinion a reaction, a response. And what we need is a reminder to pull us back to the center of who God made us to be. Do you remember who God made you to be, what he has saved you from, what path he has put you on? So I thought, what what would be good to say? And in God's providence, he has led us to Titus 3 in our study of Titus. He has given us several reminders that we need to hear from this text. First, I would remind you as a church, fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, to be submissive to rulers and authorities. We don't like this one. I don't like this one. Let that weigh on us as it should. The very words of God Almighty, the supreme authority above all authorities says to the church, be submissive to rulers and authorities. Now, I know there are a lot of qualifiers that we could put in place concerning that command. But first, let's just, let's just take it at face value. Examine your own heart and life. Are you submissive to rulers and authorities above you? Taxes, laws, regulations, policies, speed limits. Are you submissive to the governing authorities above us? That's not my question. That's God's question. And before you say, well, we have a wicked government, I'm not submitting to what's evil, 
Let me remind you that God gave these commands to submit to governing authorities in times where the governing authorities of Rome and Crete would make our government look like purity. When Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar, you don't want to know where that money was going in Rome. The money that was used to kill the Savior of the world. Peter gives similar exhortations in 1 Peter 2 and even commands servants to be submissive to rulers. Listen, not just the ones who are good and fair, but to even the ones who are evil and harsh. Romans 13.1 says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed and those who resist will incur judgment. When you feel like kicking the man in the teeth, remember, God is the one who put the man there. Now, are there times where we must say with the apostles in Acts 5.29, against the authorities, we must obey God rather than men? Yes, there are times. So here's a question. Here's, here's one we all want to know. When do we disobey the government? When is it appropriate? I've heard a good principle put like this. When the government forbids what the Lord commands and commands what the Lord forbids. So we saw these both in Daniel, in our study of Daniel a few months ago. We saw both. When the government forbids what the Lord commands. So they said, no one is allowed to pray except to the king. And what does Daniel do? He goes to his window and he prays. Or when the government commands what the Lord forbids, they say everyone must bow down to this image. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and go into the fire instead of submitting. Yes, there are times we cannot submit to the government. However, I would argue that Christians should seek to bend over backwards before defiance is exercised. I'm not saying that Christians should shift on convictions. I'm not saying that there aren't some really hard gray issues where churches are going to disagree. I'm saying Christians should be as flexible as possible to obey God in submitting to the governing authorities that he has sovereignly put in place. Why? Why would Paul, why would God have this command? Because every action from the believer is a representation of of God to the world. When we get all hot and bothered by a political issue, what are we communicating to the world about what matters most to us? Are we prepared to suffer wrongly sometimes because we have a greater conviction that there is a God who will make all things right and it's not up to us to execute judgment and justice at all times? I would humbly put before you that many Americans are more zealous to defend their rights than they are to put forward a biblical picture of Christianity. Our nation is built upon the pillars of freedom and rights, which I'm very thankful for and which I have benefited from. But Christians, you will have a hard time submitting to governing authorities when you feel your liberties and rights are infringed upon if you're more concerned with being an American than you are with being a Christian. Most of the Christians around the world do not enjoy the liberties we have in America. And I'll remind you that the governmental landscape of the world has first been instituted by God for his sovereign purposes. Nowhere has he promised that we would be free except free in Christ. Therefore, we can submit to government, governmental authorities in this world because we possess a greater freedom that the world cannot offer Does your life demonstrate that? Next, Paul reminds us to be obedient. We don't like that one either. Because remember, our sinful nature hates obedience. 
This is what went wrong in the garden. Adam and Eve failed to obey God, and as a result, the rebellious, disobedient nature was spread to all men. When you feel a resistance to obedience, stop and reflect upon the fact that you are following in the footsteps of Adam instead of Christ. Would outsiders examine the lives of Christians and say, you know, those are some of the most stubborn, mean-spirited, obstinate, resistant people we know? Or would they say they are some of the most kind and willing to endure wrong people we know? How can they be like that? What contentment do they they have that we don't? While I'm wrecked over this silly policy, why aren't they? They? How quick we are to call customer service when we don't like a company's policy. How quick we are to go to the complaint form. You know what I'm talking about. What are we known for in a world that's watching? Paul also reminds us to be ready for every good work. Next in the text there. Christians don't ask whose turn it is. We don't ask what's in it for me before we act. We don't ask, will this action make me look liberal or will this action make me look conservative? How about we look at good works and ask, will this action help me portray Christ well? Can I do this in obedience to God and love for my neighbor? Paul says, be ready, jump on good work opportunities. Next, Paul reminds us to speak evil of no one. I would encourage you on your social media platforms to make your password speak evil of no one. Have you ever seen a child throw a tantrum? You know, screaming, kicking, flailing his arms. How many of us would look at that parent carrying that child out of a store and say, oh, look how submissive that child is being going with his parent. We wouldn't. I mean, the child is going, but we all know he doesn't want to. How many of us would say, we submit to governing authorities, but we do so while we hold our nose and we kick and scream and everyone knows by the evil we speak against others exactly what we feel. Are we willing to formally obey the boss at work, but behind his back, everyone knows how much we dislike him by our words? You can't get on social media without seeing someone speak evil of someone else. Politics has become two sides of the aisle throwing verbal grenades at each other. Remember who we are representing. Jesus was slapped, beaten, falsely accused, and he spoke evil of no one. Your witness for Christ will be more compelling as you quietly trust in him to fight your battles for you. Stabbing people with words may make you feel good for a moment, but in that moment, you're actually following the devil more than you are Christ. Finally, I'll summarize the last three. Paul reminds us to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, to show perfect courtesy to all people. If I ask you to describe the heart of Jesus in two words, what two words would you use? Jesus actually answered the question for us in Matthew eleven twenty nine. 29. Listen to what he says. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls. How many of us are brash and and high when Jesus is gentle and lowly. I found recently this is a great challenge for me as a dad. I want my children to learn from me. I want them to listen to me. I want to have a good relationship with them. But I have to ask myself this question repeatedly. Am I gentle and lowly with them or am I harsh and demanding? Jesus is a shepherd, not a sergeant. He is an honored king, not a cruel dictator. Paul also says Christians are people who avoid quarreling. Let me ask you this. What in this entire world is worth quarreling over? Seriously, like parking spaces, 
our place in line being put on hold, traffic not getting our way. I got off of social media about a year ago because one, one in one part of this temptation for quarreling. Some may justify it by calling it discussion. Some may even call it apologetics, but often our accusing tones and our judgment of motives prove that we're actually quarreling with each other. The next time you're tempted to be overly passionate about an issue, ask yourself, is this worth me being known for? Paul also says Christians so, show courtesy toward all people. He holds nothing back. It doesn't get easier. And you know it's easy to show courtesy to people that you like, people that are like us. But Christians show courtesy to all people. About seven years ago, I was preaching at a church and in my sermon, I used the illustration about having the president over for dinner. I'll let you do the math who was president. I was, making the case, I was making the point that whoever the president is, how special of occasion it would be to have the president over for, to your house for dinner and how you would prepare well for it. After the sermon, I had an older man come up to me and he said, if the president showed up to my house, I'd slam a door in his face. <laughs> how courteous, I thought. This is the exact opposite of courtesy to all people. Think about someone who hates you, is politically different from you, who disagrees with everything you say. How rare it is in our society for you to love someone like that and show perfect courtesy to. That's radical. It's otherworldly. It's breathtaking to buy dinner for the man who spits in your face. Friends, that is Christian. These are the reminders that Paul gives he says, these are the ways you should be different from a pagan society you live in. Why? Because you've been changed. This is how he argues. He says, if you, you'll notice this in verse three. You can be different because verse three, our, we ourselves were foolish. At one time we were blind, we were dead in our sins. At one time we argued about silly things. He says, you can be different because we ourselves were disobedient. At one time, we hated authority. We wanted to be our own master. We had the mentality of no one's going to tell me what to do. He says you can be different because at one time we were led astray. We thought we knew best. He says we can be different because at one time we were slaves to passions and pleasures. We didn't live for God's way. We lived for what felt right and felt good. He says you can be different. Because at one time, we lived in malice and envy. We looked for quarreling and we spewed evilness about others. He says, you can be different because at one time, we were hated by others and we hated others ourselves. How we treated other people caused them to hate us. And there was a time where we'd shake our finger at the TV or we'd shake our finger at the coworker and say, I hate them. Paul says, you've been changed. You're different now. Friends, I'd ask you, have you been changed? Are you living like you've been changed? Or are you living like you once were? Regardless of how you answer that question, how would everyone else answer that question about you? How did the change happen? We close with verse four. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. He saved us from that worldly lifestyle and he saved us from the judgment that would come because of it. The word saved there, it's a good biblical word. It's one that we don't need to lose in our vocabulary because we're ashamed of it or something like saved from hell or saved from God's wrath or some that kind of cringe at that. It's a good biblical word. We're going to look at more of what it means next week. We've been saved. We've been changed. So does your life reflect this reality? Do you wear the name of Christ and still look just like the world? Friends, I would humbly and reverently put before you, if you haven't been changed, you haven't been saved. And if you're truly been saved, 
you'll see a change because saved people are changed people and changed people are different people from the world. When you see a butterfly, the next time you see a butterfly, think of the Christian life. Butterflies start out as caterpillars. Caterpillars go through a radical transformation which leads to new life than they had before. Caterpillars crawl and they scoot, they're slow and they're ugly, in my opinion. When they're transformed, they take on new abilities. They become butterflies. They are graceful. They fly. They are beautiful. They don't go back to their former life. Why? Because they've been changed and it is stunningly noticeable. Believers, you have been saved. You have been changed. Is it stunningly noticeable? Let's pray. Oh God, we recognize these are the words from you. I pray that you would give all the believers in the room your grace to, yes, submit to governing authorities, to be obedient, to avoid quarreling, to be courtesy, to, courtesy, to show courtesy to all people. I pray that you would Help us speak evil of no one. Why? Because we have been changed. I pray, God, that you would give us grace to live differently because we are different. We need your help in this. There are tons of gray areas, Lord, that seems like hard decisions have to be made. I pray above all, we would be known for people who love you and are content in you. I pray in Christ's name. Amen.